So as we've seen, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity developed in the early church as the church responded to heretical views. Now, the church responded to, for example, the heretical views of Arianism. And in response to Arianism, the church confessed that Jesus is fully God, consubstantial with the Father. Now, in a similar way, um, the doctrine of the Incarnation, the doctrine re uh, revolving around Jesus Christ, develops in response to uh, early heretical views. And today, I want to look at uh, one of those uh, important stages in the development uh, of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, uh, the Council of Ephesus, and the controversy revolving around Nestorius. Now, in the early church, the church really responded to three significant questions regarding Jesus Christ. First, is Jesus Christ fully God? Second, is Jesus Christ fully human? And third, what is the relationship between the Son's divine and human natures? Now, when we hear these questions, we might think, ah, these are simply theological puzzles. They're abstract questions uh, that the church was led to, to ask uh, because of maybe problems in philosophy or things like this. But no, really, these questions get at the heart, the core, the center of the Christian faith. These questions revolve around who is Jesus Christ? And when we say that in the person and work of Jesus Christ, God becomes human, God takes the flesh of Jesus Christ, what do we mean by that? The first question, is Jesus fully God, was primarily answered at the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. Uh, at these councils, the church affirmed that Jesus is fully God, and in response to Arianism, they said that Jesus is consubstantial, that is of the same substance, the Greek term is homoousion. Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, but there was questions that remained about Jesus Christ. In particular, there's questions about how do we confess the humanity of Jesus Christ? And if we are to confess that Jesus Christ is truly fully God and fully human, how did these two as these two aspects, the, what we will what the church will call natures, the human nature and the divine nature, how do these two uh, relate? Now, these questions are answered in the late 4th into the 5th century. And like the um, uh, like the controversy regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, really it's at some key ecumenical councils that the doctrine of the Incarnation gets hammered out. And so there's three uh, key significant councils when it comes to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. First, there's the Council of Constantinople in 381. Second, the, Con the Council of Ephesus in 431. And finally, there's the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Now, what the church comes to, the, the solution or conclusion that the church comes to as a result of these councils is that in the single person of Jesus Christ, there are mysteriously united two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. These two natures are united within the person of Jesus Christ without separation and without confusion. Now you can think of um, oil and water and if you put oil and water uh, into a jar and shake it up it doesn't matter how hard you shake it uh, these two uh, don't blend together they don't make a single substance they remain distinct. This is the idea when, when the church talks about two natures without confusion without separation. If you compare then this to an image of uh, water and wine mixing together in a glass uh, really these two uh, blend together seamlessly. You can't distinguish them um, when they're mixed together. By 451 at the Council of Chalcedon, the church developed this language that in the single person of Jesus Christ, the two natures, human and divine, are mysteriously united without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. So today we're going to look at one of the most politically motivated stages in the development of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the Council of Ephesus. Now this council actually provides us with an illustration not only of how doctrine develops, that is how the church responds to um, heretical views, and oftentimes this happens through ecumenical councils, but it also provides us with an illustration of just how politics did shape the development of Christian doctrine. The Council of Ephesus centers on 
a dispute between two bishops of the early church, the Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius, and the, and the Bishop of Alexandria, Cyril. Now, both bishops were fairly militant. Nestorius had this reputation for violently persecuting Arians, and Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, also had no trouble marshalling power and political devices, public support, in order to defend his theological views. I mean, Cyril went so far as to send spies to Constantinople to try to find evidence of Nestorius's heretical views. So underlying a theological dispute about the incarnation between these two bishops was a political rivalry between Roman cities. Now, at this time, Constantinople had really ascended to the second most important see in the Roman Empire. It was second only to Rome. This position of power was previously held by Alexandria, so really there was jealousy here. Constantinople had become the place of special privilege. It was also the hub of the imperial court, and so they had more access to the emperor, which gave them more influence as well. Now, Antioch and Alexandria had this much longer history, um, but now, by all measures, they really were superseded by Constantinople, and even Constantinople was claiming this title of the New Rome. There's an additional problem um, with the city of Jerusalem. Now, under Constantine, Jerusalem had become the center of Christian pilgrimage, and so many Christians from throughout the empire would travel to Jerusalem to the Holy Land, and as a result, the influence of the city of Jerusalem increased substantially. So in the early 5th century, there's really this power struggle between these four cities in the east, between Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Jerusalem. And what we see in this power struggle is that for the early church, we can't fully separate the theological controversies from the political scene. Now, before we look at the history, the Council of Ephesus, I want to clarify um, how we're going to use these terms Nestorius and Nestorianism. Now, because of the underlying political motivations, as well as newly discovered historical evidence, particularly a writing of Nestorius, um, most scholars tend now to separate Nestorianism from Nestorius himself. Now, Nestorianism is the heresy which was named after Nestorius. It's this error that separates the human and divine natures of Christ. It separates the eternal Son of God from the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as strange as this might sound, it's very unlikely that Nestorius actually held the position of Nestorianism. It's more than likely that Nestorius died orthodox. What really was happening here is that Cyril was putting words into Nestorius's mouth in an effort again of political maneuvering. Now, I know that this might be hard to hear, but this is something that was quite common in the early church. It is true um, that Nestorius, as we'll see, denied the term Theotokos, but what he denied in addition to that is very unclear. And so what we see here is an intentional outing of Nestorius. And so what I want to do, and what I'll do in this lecture, is I'll speak both of the heresy of Nestorianism, which is, again, the separation of the divine and human natures, but also the historical figure of Nestorius. Nestorius was born around 386, and he became the bishop of Constantinople in 428. He died in exile in 450. Now, again, much of what we know about Nestorius' theology comes from the writings of his opponents. One of the main ones, of course, is Cyril of Alexandria. Scholars debate the extent to which Nestorius himself held the views that his opponents say he did. Of course, it's possible that Nestorius's views uh, developed over time, and so the writings that we have now from him, which seem to be orthodox, um, re represent his more mature position. Uh, it's also possible that he uh, changed his views uh, in response to his criticisms, um, and or he changed his views simply to defend his reputation. What is clear, though, is that the writings that we have from Nestorius seem to indicate that he died with orthodox views. Nestorius was particularly influenced by Theodore of Mopsuestia. Now, what um, 
Nestorius does is he takes his teacher's teaching on the divinity of Christ and really expands it. Now, so what Nestorius is trying to do is protect Christ's divinity. Now, the question that is raised is, does he protect Christ's divinity in such a way that he ultimately separates the human and divine nature? This is what Nestorius' opponents say or argue that he actually did. Now, there is some reason for this. The major reason is that Nestorius rejects an, a term that had grown to have quite a bit of significance at this time. That's the term theotokos. This term can be translated God-bearer or mother of God. And the term was used to refer to Mary as the mother of the divine son. Now, the question that is raised, though, is, is this rejection of this term Theotokos, is it ultimately based upon a separation, not merely a distinction, but a separation of the divine and human natures? Nestorianism was associated with this phrase, God in a man. Now, it seems different than confessing Jesus is God. It almost seems like um, Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, is almost like the instrument of the Son of God. And this is why some of Nestorius' opponents were very critical of him. Now, Nestorius' concern, though, is God's infinity, his eternality, and God's omnipresence. For Nestorius, God can't be locally confined. And so, Nestorius opted and preferred for this term Christotokos, which can be translated Christ-bearer, and he preferred this term um, as opposed to Theotokos. Now, Cyril of Alexandria took major issue with Nestorius's view, particularly with Nestorius's rejection of Theotokos. For Cyril, Nestorianism was an attack on the very mystery of the Incarnation, which was our foundation of salvation. For Cyril, if Mary is not Theotokos, Jesus is not truly God incarnate. And so that is what Cyril at least heard, or at least uh, argued that he heard. Now, there is another issue at play. Uh, Cyril really thought that Nestorius was, a, was divisive. He was an innovator. Rather than accepting the accepted language of Nicaea and Constantinople, Nestorius had to opt for a new term, this term Christotokos, and for Cyril, this will simply not do. Now, Nestorius's rejection of this term led Cyril to argue that Nestorius so distinguished the two natures that he implicitly argued that Jesus was two distinct persons. Now, if this is the case, which again I said it's not too clear whether or not it is, but if this is the case, we would call this Nestorianism, the heresy of separating the natures, so much so that it's almost as though there are two distinct persons, the eternal Son of God and then Jesus Christ from Nazareth. But again, I think it's important that we distinguish between Nestorianism and the historical figure Nestorius. Now, in any case, uh, Cyril is able to convince uh, the Pope of Rome, Celestine, that this issue is significant enough that they ought to have a synod, and so they do in 430. The problem here is that uh, Nestorius simply doesn't attend. And so even though at this synod the title uh, Theotokos is accepted and Nestorianism is condemned, because Nestorius does not attend, the synod just doesn't accomplish much, frankly. And so in 431, you have the emperor calling another meeting. This time, it will be a meeting held in Ephesus. Now, this is where things get really messy. So at the time in which the meeting was supposed to start, uh, the bishop of Antioch, John, um, was running late. He couldn't get there on time. And now Cyril had this, uh, this really this option of either waiting, which was the appropriate thing to do, or starting um, the council. And what Cyril opts to do is start the council without the bishop of Antioch. Now, understandably, this upsets Nestorius. It upsets him so much that when he finally gets to Ephesus, he decides to have a separate assembly. And so John of Antioch and Nestorius of Constantinople have a separate meeting amongst themselves. And so really what you have here in Ephesus is you have two separate assemblies happening at the same time. Now, these two separate groups come to different conflicts conclusions. Now, this raises 
a serious question for the emperor because what is he to do when you have um, really disunity in the church um, and also you have two separate meetings what the emperor theodosius does is sides with the majority that is he sides with cyril but this creates several problems first nestorius is condemned not only for heresy but he's also accused of divisiveness the council also created another issue many thought that the way that the council was conducted was simply legitimate and so they did not um, consider the council's declarations official now despite the political maneuvering of cyril despite the confusion that was raised by the council i think that we are right to see um, this as really a step in the development of the doctrine of christ the church uh, accepted this term theotokos and it really solidified what it means to confess that Jesus is incarnate. The Council of Ephesus also helps to carve out space for the Chalcedon definition. That is, the confession that in the one person of Christ, two natures, divine and human, are mysteriously united, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation.